This is a, a very important collaboration between the Division of Biological Sciences at UC San Diego and the San Diego Natural History Museum, where what our goal is is to bring to the public domain a taste of cutting edge research um, that is going on um, on our campus by our campus scientists. And this year we've chosen um, as the topic Nature Matters, the idea being to give you a taste of what modern ecology and field biology um, is like, what the results of that research is, and how it not only points to the challenges that our planet are facing, but very importantly how this science that's being done at UC San Diego is also providing many of the answers to some of the, the challenges that our planet faces. Our division um, consists of four different uh, departments and last year we had a lecture series called uh, Evolution Matters. And uh, our four departments work together in a collaborative environment where our mission really is that of teaching, research, and public service. And really the, the whole concept here is that biological sciences as a whole very much is relevant today, whether it be infectious disease or genetic diseases or, as we're going to hear about tonight, the health of our planet. Biology really is at the heart of many of, of these questions. And tonight's inaugural lecture by Professor Woodruff is going to be part of a five lecture series that you can see here on this slide. So you'll see there's a great range of speakers, be it um, climate change and ecosystems in Southern California, to biological invasions in your backyard, how species survive in the desert, and learning very much about the secret life of bees. We really can't mount a lecture series like this and uh, the, the effort that it takes without sponsorship. And that sponsorship comes uh, really in, in a variety of ways and is absolutely critical to us being able to deliver these types of science lectures to you. So I'm really pleased to um, thank our sponsors publicly and to welcome representatives of those sponsors here tonight. Um, and uh, our key sponsors are Amelin Corporation, uh, based here in, in San Diego, Kieran Farmer, USA, and we're pleased for the first time this year in the Science Matters Lecture Series to welcome the Ray Thomas Edwards Foundation as a key sponsor to this series. These really are the lectures that, that keep on talking, and you'll be able to find these lectures up on our website, and you see the web address here, and uh, they'll also be broadcast on UCSD TV, and you'll be able to look at the uh, TV schedule. So if you have have students, friends, family members who miss this lecture and you think they should catch up on it, there's both broadcast and online opportunities in which to find that. So in thinking about this series um, this year, I very much reached to my own childhood for the inspiration. And that inspiration comes from the fact that I was very lucky to grow up on a small island called Jersey. And as a child growing up on this island, uh, I was lucky to interact quite a bit with this gentleman, Gerald Durrell, or Jerry Durrell. And Jerry uh, basically dedicated his life to the field of biological conservation, and he founded a small zoo on the island that focused on endangered species. And through a whole series of very clever and funny books, he inspired a, a generation of, of British children, and in fact around the world, to be conscious about issues associated with conservation and, and endangered species. So that brings me tonight to our very own Gerald Durrell at, uh, at UCSD, which is Professor David Woodruff. Now David, um, like many great scientists, was born in the United Kingdom and um, <laughs> shortly after uh, his education there, uh, he moved to Australia uh, where he did his PhD and also received a Doctor of Science degree from the University of, of Melbourne down there in Australia. Uh, he then came back to the US and spent five years in a, in a very prestigious research fellowship at Harvard University and then arrived in 1979 at UC San Diego where he's remained ever since. He was the founding chair of our um, ecology, behavior and evolution section at UC San Diego uh, 
and he currently is a trustee of the Zoological Society of San Diego and fosters research and conservation at San Diego Zoo, the Wild Animal Park, and the Center for Reproduction of Endangered Species. He's very well known and incredibly well respected for his cutting edge work in using genetic tools to look at population structures um, in endangered species, ranging from shrikes to gibbons all the way to elephants. And he'll be really telling us tonight um, how his world leading research has really raised a, a lot of, of questions about how we should be managing our natural resources and what we can expect from ecosystems, but very much also why scientific research can lead some hope in managing those natural resources. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Professor David Woodruff. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, Dean Kay, I appreciate the, uh, well, it's an honor to be asked to uh, help kick off this year's series. And uh, I always feel after an introduction like that, it's all downhill from here, but I'll, I'll try, bear with me. I've been asked tonight to uh, work with you, to talk with you about whether nature matters or whether we can live quite nicely, thank you, in some sort of post-natural world without plants, without animals, not needing fungi anymore except those that we use to produce our favorite beverages and things like that. So if you grew up with Walt Disney or Hollywood, this is your vision of the world, of nature. It's nature tooth and claw, it's really a, a social uh, construct of, of our society. It's not really what goes on out in nature. Uh, the world is not dominated by man, uh, other mammals, and a few bad penguins. There really is more to it, and I'll try to bring that across in the next few minutes. The reality is we share the planet with about 10 million other species. And we live at an instant in time when half the large things on the planet are threatened with extinction in the lifetime of some people in this room. Perhaps since you got up this morning, 40 species have gone extinct. That over the year would add up to the best estimate for how many species are disappearing at the moment. A rate of extinction that was, uh, is without precedent in the last 65 million years. Now most of the species that are going extinct are unknown to me, unknown to you, unknown to science. But that's just the way it's going to be. And they're probably, if we're lucky, not the mammals and birds we feel so strongly about. I hate to tell you this, but you live on the planet of the beetles. You might think there are a lot of mammal species, five and a half thousand, but there are 200 beetle species for every mammal species. And keep that, our relative taxonomic insignificance in mind when I talk about the importance of nature. Nature is not just about us. I'm not going to give a scientific or academic or technical lecture tonight, but I am going to use three words again and again, and I'm going to use them the following way. I'm going to use nature to mean biodiversity. Extinction, I think everybody understands. And conservation, I've defined here very positively. So biodiversity is the variety of the Earth's organisms, their genetic uh, diversity, through to the big assemblages they form. So genes, populations, species, communities, and biomes. And over the next two hours, you said two hours, didn't you? Oh, right. Uh, I'll be going through examples at these different levels. Conservation defined positively does not mean preservation, which means fixing things in time. I believe that what we should strive to do is keep nature in a condition that enables it to change, to evolve as circumstances change. So I've defined it as the management of, you can read that faster than I can, and with a better accent, I apologize for mine. So what I'd like to do is spend the whole evening talking about the wonders of the rainforest, because if you could save rainforest, you'd be saving half the species on the planet Earth today. Or if you're a marine biologist, perhaps you'd like me to focus on coral reefs, biodiversity hotspots in the marine realm. Unfortunately, much as I'd love to do that, I really feel I need to draw your attention to one species 
One species that is halfway through, through destroying all the rainforests and destroying all the coral reefs. And that species you know about. We're proud members of that species. And here's what the planet Earth looks like from space. These are lights at night put together over a three-month period when there were no clouds over Southern California or over the south of England or over the Japanese islands. And what you'll see here is you'll see San Diego or Los Angeles actually and San Francisco and you'll see the great cities of Europe and you might be able to make out rivers because they have cities on their banks or the Trans-Siberian Railway because there are cities along the tracks. But if you go to the tropics, you'll find lights there too, and these are tiny little fires lit one forest patch at a time as poor farmers clear land to grow f food for their families. So our own species activities are visible from space. We now use 40% of the entire planet's gross primary productivity every year. We usurp almost half all the biological activity or the energy produced by it every year. So we have a footprint and this graph shows humanity's ecological footprint and how it's changed in the last 50 years. The horizontal black line shows one planet, 1 1.0, that's all we have. The red line shows what humanity takes from the planet. And as the population grows, and as our appetite for resources grows, we have passed the 1.0 point, and we're now living as if we had 1.2 planets. The population is exploding, of course, still, and we are living as if we had many planets. So we're living unsustainably. We're living what I call an ecological lie. If you were born in 1988, of course, I'll hold you, hold you absolutely blameless for what's going on. You can blame your parents who ramped this curve up. <clears throat> Look at the map of the world where the countries are drawn proportional to the number of people living in each nation. So China and India and the United States look very bloated. Now the darkness of the color on the map tells us a little bit about how many Earths the people in that nation depend on for their normal state of living, quality of life, call it what you will, or lack of quality of life. So in the United States, we, on average, live as if there were three planets available for us, just us. Same in most of Europe, same in Australia. Other countries live on less, but other countries are growing and developing, and China and India aspire to live at our lifestyle and they too will draw down. So the footprint will get larger and larger. Now we've got into this pickle for a variety of historical reasons and every now and again I'll jump out of science into history. We Europeans discovered a poorly defended continent to North and South America. We discovered fossil fuels those advances made it possible for the Industrial Revolution and from there a lot of catch-up by other countries around the world. I'll show you that what we've done since then can be explained away by technology and the ingenious use of engineering. There's nothing we can't do. Would you like to move mountains? Here's one of 450 that have gone in the Appalachians with apologies, of course, to Dr. Seuss for the, oh, the things we can do. Cut continents in half, here's the Panama Canal from space. Drain lakes, here's the Aral Sea in 1989 and 2003. This sea in Central Asia is 200 miles across, 300 miles, 400 miles across, it's gone. Here is Manhattan and the Hudson River showing what we have done to convert some areas into urban scapes. Now I'm putting this up to draw your attention to a wonderful book called The World Without Us. It's a paperback, it's easy reading, it's fascinating. And if you go to Scientific American magazine, you will find that they've put in a video clip which portrays what happens if all of a sudden humans were to leave the scene. I'll come back to that scenario. We won't be so lucky. Most of our conversion of habitat, though, is one field, one patch at a time. 
And of course the smoke going up contributes to global warming. So we can change the atmosphere too, whether we like it or not. And here's the San Diego Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UCSD Keeling Curve. The black line is CO2 going towards doubling. The red line are global temperatures tracking the curve very closely. If we raise the temperature, we'll raise sea levels because Greenland will melt and it's melting faster than expected. So the United States on the left ascribes or has as policy planning for a half meter rise in sea level in the next hundred years. European nations generally recognize that the sea level will rise at least two meters and so they're planning for a scenario shown on the right at the lower where two meters of water will flood Bangkok and flood the rice growing delta of the Mekong River. That's from some work I've been doing. So let me try to summarize the dismal state of the planet. The forests are half gone, the grasslands are 70% degraded, lakes are acidified, oceans are polluted and turning sour, that means acid. Coral reefs will be gone in this century, and so on and so on and so on, and I get down to ecosystem services are threatened, and I'll spend three minutes on that in about 15, no, in about 30 minutes time. But I've been asked to talk about the last thing on the list, biodiversity. And all I can say is that we're living in the onset of a sixth great mass extinction. The last one was 65 million years ago when an asteroid hit the Caribbean near the coast of Yucatan and the, di the last of the dinosaurs went extinct. So it should be clear why we say there's a biodiversity crisis. The map shows in brown where we've already converted countryside and habitat into land that we can grow things on. Now turn your attention to the tropics. Half the species on the planet live in the tropics, but half the tropical forests are degraded or will be gone in the next 20 years. And so it's no surprise that about a quarter of the mammals and other things we care about are threatened with extinction. The most significant cause of extinction is habitat destruction. Let's stop worrying about the tropics. Let's bring it home. Here is the Olympic National Forest in, Was in Washington State, and here's the spotted owl that was used with the power of the Endangered Species Act to slow down the rate of clear-cutting in our national forests. As the forest goes, so go the species. Why is area so important? This is a simple diagram showing that large areas have more species than small areas. If you think about orchids, if you think about frogs, if you think about tree species, and you go to a large area, you will typically find more species than you will in a small area. If you plot these results on a log-log curve, you will get, to your amazement, a straight line plot. And this works around the world with all sorts of groups of plants and animals. Now consider what happens if you go from having a lot of habitat to less habitat. The bottom line is that a tenfold decrease in area cuts the number of species that can be supported in half. And that's why we say area is so important. And that's why we can predict a faunal collapse on this planet in the next few hundred years, thousand years. Time doesn't matter to animals. Four-year cycles of no meaning to anything except snowshoe hares and lemmings and things like that. Oh, and politicians. <laughs> but I promised myself no moose tonight, okay? The moose slides are gone. So here we have the collapse of species on the planet. If you save 2% of the world in national parks, then you can save 10% of the biota. It's not really that bad. 50% of the higher vertebrates will go extinct but when we can argue about. Our prediction is that we're going to lose 10% though in the next 20 years. How does this compare to what happened when the dinosaurs went extinct? The rate of extinction now is 1,000 times faster than it was when the last dinosaurs disappeared. So now let's go back to the five causes of extinction. The first one was a habitat destruction. destruction. The second is overhunting, the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon was the commonest bird in North America. Flocks of over two billion birds flew along the east coast of this country. 
all gone. Last one, Martha, 1914. So whatever your favorite species is, it's probably fast becoming threatened or endangered. I put up some of mine here, gibbons, elephants, nautilus, and whales. Whales, of course, don't stand a chance under present trends. Third cause of species extinction, invasive species. And David Holway has a whole lecture in this species about Argentine ants and other species. Argentine ants, of course, the ants that took over California. Uh, we brought brown snakes accidentally from Asia to the island of Guam, and they ate every bird on the island. Kudzu vine covers the trees along roadsides in Georgia and Florida. I won't tell you what a nightmare zebra mussels are. Fourth re reason species go extinct is, whoops, sorry, didn't mean to hurt you. And that's what happened to the peregrine falcon or the grebe on Clear Lake in Northern California when we blanketed the earth in DDT and other chemicals that did not degrade in natural communities. And it was Rachel Carson that we thank for alerting us to this hazard. Finally, the fifth cause of extinction, just getting recognition now, is global warming. And a paper out last month says that about 20% of species on the planet will be threatened one way or the other by global warming. Earlier this year, the US government listed the uh, polar bear under the Endangered Species Act because with the loss of sea ice, it cannot feed its offspring and it is threatened. Given these threats, it's not surprising that most people equate the conservation crisis or the biodiversity crisis with saving species. And it shouldn't surprise you, therefore, that the World Wildlife Fund uses as its icon, as its mascot, the uh, giant panda. Now, my own involvement with single species con conservation arose out of my research on the evolution of animal species. I had it all wrong. I was looking backwards through time, trying to figure out how species got here. What conservation biologists do is they look forward, and they should, if it's science, be able to tell you how to get a species a hundred or a thousand generations in the future. So my own transition from evolutionary biology to conservation biology came largely because I was fortunate enough to come to San Diego. And it was at about that time that we learned that some charismatic megavertebrates were in, were in trouble for genetic reasons. And the icon of that, the exemplar of that, is the cheetah. Cheetahs across Africa are very, very closely related to one another. They're as closely related as family members are, as sibs, as brother and sister. That means that if a new virus disease comes along and one cheetah is susceptible, then they are all susceptible. So low genetic variability is a real problem. And I got interested in applying evolutionary genetics to species that were under threat of extinction. My first opportunity came in a paternity case at the San Diego Zoo, not mine, okay. <laughs> Here's a bonobo with its offspring, and using blood provided by the veterinarians, we were able to show who the father was. And they said, that's wonderful, now do the rhino, and they gave me some rhino blood, and I was able to sort out which male was actually the father of this baby white rhino. And I thought, this is my ticket to Africa. I'm going to get to work on real animals in the wild. But think about it. How do you get a blood sample from a rhino? You walk up to the baby with a very large needle, okay, and you ask the mother's permission. You know, this is a death, def I mean, this is not what's going to work. The animals don't understand that you're trying to help them. Consider what happened. <laughs> the door of this truck says, save the elephants. <laughs> but the elephant didn't understand that. It's a tribute to Toyota's engineering that the researchers got out alive. But there was no future thinking I could go to somewhere exotic and work on the genetics of wild animals. The solution came around 1989 when it was discovered that human hair has DNA in it. So here's a student of mine demonstrating the two-handed DNA sampling method. <laughs> Understand that if you 
groom orphan animals. They like it. They like the attention. And so my student was able to get hair samples from these gibbons at an orphanage in northern Thailand. And then we used the polymerase chain reaction to amplify mitochondrial DNA sequences, nuclear DNA sequences, and hypervariable markers in the nuclear genome called microsatellites, or simple sequence repeats, which are so variable you can tell apart family members. So this was our entree, this discovery that hair had DNA in it, into conservation genetics in the wild. And the hairiest things I could think of were chimpanzees. And also I could ride in on the human genome that had just begun. And so with Jane Goodall's uh, cooperation, we went to Gombe and we genotyped all the animals she had been studying for 25 years. And we found out just who the fathers were and who the mothers were and worked out the formal pedigree. And then we turned to bigger questions about how chimps in different parts of Africa are related to one another. And the question is, how do you get hair from a chimp? Now, Dr. Goodall wouldn't let you go anywhere near her chimps, because that would undo 20, 30 years of hard work getting them habituated. But chimps are hairy, and we knew a little bit about natural history of chimps. And at night, chimps go up to the treetops and they build a nest. I thought this was something birds did, silly me. Chimps go to the treetops to get away from leopards and they fold over the branches and they put leaves on them and they sleep. And unlike us, they sleep alone. So you can watch a chimp going up a tree and in the morning you see it coming down. And then it's a simple matter of getting a graduate student trained to climb trees, okay? <laughs> so Philip Morin, who is now in San Diego as the senior geneticist at the Federal Southwest Fisheries Lab, spent his PhD years here genotyping wild chimps across Africa. He never saw these animals, okay? But he found nests. And later, Pascal Gunner, who's also here in San Diego, went out to West Africa, and this is what they found. They found the books are all wrong. Our closest living relative, we didn't have a clue what was going on in its family life. There's some details there. It's science. It's a mock-up. Science rejected my paper. I had to publish it in a slightly more senior magazine. Um, but that shows gorillas and humans and chimps and bonobos, and they're very, very variable relative to humans, which are the little carmine cluster at the 3 o'clock position on the tree here. That's a thousand, uh, it's 1111 different human mitochondrial haplotypes. So don't be offended if that's a naked female silhouette. This is matrilineally inherited. And the same for the chimps and the gorillas. But what the map shows is that there are different types of gorillas across Africa. And some of them have been different for over a million years and evolving in different directions from one another. And I would argue that would make them different species. That is an ongoing scientific argument, but for the time being, please don't mix them up in cages. Please don't mix them up in your management plans. So non-invasive genotyping revolutionized our understanding of our closest living relatives. Now I want to turn to another really well-known animal, the African elephant. You know it's different from the Asian elephant. Those are the two elephants alive today. And you can see the baby there being trained to pull hair from the hair of the mother. It's really easy not. Elephants are really dangerous animals. So in the case of genotyping, we couldn't get access to hair. Laurie Eggert, my student who did this work, had to stoop to poop. So here she is with an armed guard with a teaspoon collecting her DNA samples. And from that, and going across Africa, she discovered that our understanding of African elephants was largely wrong. There are three different types of elephants in Africa. Their numbers have collapsed from probably around 3 million 100 years ago to less than half a million today. There are about 400,000 savanna elephants. There are about 100,000 elephants in the central forests. They look a little different. And out in West Africa, there are 10,000 different elephants left. Now, how do we know how many elephants are in the forest? You can't count them. If you saw them, you'd probably already be dead. Elephants do two things. They run away or they run at you. They are dangerous animals. But Laurie worked out a way of counting elephants without ever seeing them. She went to a tiny little park in Ghana. Those of you who don't know where Ghana is, 
will find the dot helpful. It is at the end of the arrow here. And there's a tiny little one pixel green dot there. That park has been isolated from other bits of forest for 60 years. We know there are elephants in it because they come out and kill people or destroy crops. But we don't know how many elephants are in there. So with a guard, Laurie walked around the park on elephant trails and collected dung samples and later genotyped them and asked, have I ever seen this elephant before? And then she built up a library, a database, and found out that there are probably about 200 to 214 elephants in the park. And because you can sex DNA, she found out how many males and how many females they are. And because there's a huge difference between baby DNA and a large elephant's dropping, super, sort of supersized, you could tell juveniles from adults. And we can tell in the 60 years they've lived there, they've lost a lot of genetic variability. So that brings me to a different type of problem. And this is the last story I'll tell about my own work. It is what happens when you take a large population and you fragment it. Each of those fragments has a few individual animals left in it, and they look healthy, and they behave as if they're healthy, but they begin to lose genetic variation by a process called genetic erosion. The technical term is inbreeding or genetic drift. And tick-tock, tick-tock, over time, they become vulnerable like cheetahs are. An example locally is the Sam Clemente loggerhead shrike. It's a little songbird that sits out on the island, 60 miles off the coast here. It crashed from hundreds of birds to 14 in about the year 1990. And we did the genetics of every one of those birds without hurting them. Non-invasive genotyping based on taking a single feather. And what we found is that there was variation there. The birds were different from those on the mainland. And they'd lost variation in the last 100 years. How did I know that? Well, thanks to the museum here and museums in LA, we have drawers full of old specimens that people went out and, hate to tell you, shot. And using ancient DNA methods, we were able to get the DNA out of those museum specimens. We know what they looked like 100 years ago. We know what they looked like today. Now, why am I fussing so much about genetic variation? The bottom line here is that the lack of genetic variation compromises a population's ability to deal with climate change or new animals in its community. It may lead to reduced fitness. It may lead to reduced evolvability. It may contribute to extinction. So I got very interested in this generic problem because the whole world is being divided up into these little fragments. And I wanted to know whether we could monitor the process so we could tell managers what was going on. Because managers don't want to know about genetics. They're so busy keeping animals alive and defending them from us that genetics is way down on their wish list. And for most of the last 2,000 years, there's been no way we could even address this question because we had no way of getting at genetic markers that were variable enough to detect change on this scale. So I'll tell you about a situation where using a suite of small mammal species, rats, mice, tree shrews, we were able to demonstrate for the first time that you can monitor the decay of variability in a recently fragmented population. I needed a place where all the fragments were created at the same time. And in southern Thailand, the government thoughtfully flooded a valley that ran up through a national park and created in that 40 mile long reservoir 190, I exaggerate, sorry, 90 tiny little islands on which were some species of mammals from the original protected rainforest. There might be 12 species on the large island, only one or two on the small islands, and we compared them to the animals of their own species a few hundred meters away across a water gap living in the protected national park. So we set up trials where one island population of mice was compared to the mainland year after year after year until I ran out of funding. Very briefly, it's a beautiful place. This island, the size of a football field, has no mammals left on it. End of story. Geneticists go home. This large island, 100 football fields, has 12 species on it. 
Inside the island, it's beautiful tropical rainforest. We have a field assistant, and if you're close enough, you'll see one of the researchers, sort of white boy in the tropics, don't do very well, that's all I can say. They exhaust very easily. Now, our scientific challenge is shown here. On the left, we predict the number of species will go down through time. And that's exactly what we found. There's no scientific discovery there. We simply confirm what was predicted to happen. But on the right is what we've known for 70 years in theory, that the variability in a population will decay over time relative to the size of the population. But we've never had markers sensitive enough to do that. The solution is the last, is the bottom two graphs here, where the yellow line shows what happened on an island for a mouse and a tree shrew, and the red line, if you can see it, or the red dot, if you can see it, shows what happens in the control. The horizontal axis shows what happened in year five, six, seven, and eight after the island was created. So by year eight on the small islands, these populations have lost variability. And now what we're trying to do, of course, is go back after 20 years and test these predictions that were developed in theory 90, 70 years ago, and everybody believes them, but nobody's ever been to show this in action before. Now, we were not trying to save the rats and mice of Thailand, of course. We were taking hair samples from them and releasing them and going back to check their descendants and their descendants' descendants. Nothing was harmed. We were using them as models of the big things like the Asian elephant, which the Thai government is interested in saving. Now, elephants once ranged from Iraq all the way across to China. They're now found in the areas painted in yellow only. And in Thailand, there are only seven herds left. And we're just completing the training of two Thai PhDs who will be able to genotype those animals. Stay tuned. Now, why am I taking you round the world when I could do all of this here in San Diego? Here's the Stevens kangaroo rat, the Pacific uh, mouse, the least bells vireo, the uh, vernal pool uh, fairy shrimp, the Del Mar, see, there's a botanist in the back row who's going to correct me, so I better get it right. The Del Mar Manzanita and the Otai Mesa Mint going around the set. These are all locally threatened. Now, should we spend a million dollars a year trying to save each one of these? I think it would be better to save habitat. In other words, I'm trying to tell you that genetics is part of our toolkit, but it's not the sole solution to the problem. So I'm going to get away from genetics. I'm not putting it down, but I think we need to go beyond genetics, way beyond genetics. So now in this part of the talk, I'm going to talk about biodiversity and what it's worth why it's important to us, why it's worth saving. And if the lights were on, I could get a sense for how many of you there have pets at home, and how many of you love animals, and how many of you have gone to beautiful places. And I can't see it, but unless I offend anybody, are some of you cat owners? I know there are. Well, I'm sorry. Are any of you dog owners? Okay, stay with me. Why do we think these things are so important? I want to talk about ecological services because we take them for granted. When you look at this beautiful picture, what do you see? I bet you don't think of atmospheric regulation or carbon storage or waste treatment. I want you to think oxygen. Why? Most of the oxygen in our atmosphere comes from microorganisms photosynthesizing near the surface of the world's ocean. Now, when I went to school, I was taught green plants. Uh-uh. Microorganisms in the ocean. Free service taken for granted. How about a waterfall? You probably don't think purification of water, storm regulation, blah, blah. And you can read this list at your leisure on the podcast or on the website later. Ecological services are what we assume nature does for us. Thank you. No payback. Think of beautiful wildflower shows in California. Do you think pollination of crops? Do you think biological pest control? Do you think food production, raw materials for fiber and building? Do you think genetic resources for drugs and pharmaceuticals? Do you think recreational value or cultural value? Now, all of these things do have a price tag. We're extremely reluctant to go this way, but if you insist, I'll tell you, 
Yes, we can put a price on nature. It was last done by an international team 10 years ago. The value was $33 trillion a year in 1997 dollars, back when dollars were really worth a lot, okay? That's more than the total value of all human activities on the planet, which I didn't get to look up today, but I think it's about $18 trillion. So, if nature was a utility company, and going the way we've suggested, we'd have a bailout plan in place. Do you realize that we're damaging nature now to the tune, this was published last month, of $68 billion a year? That's the annual cost in what we're doing in our disregard for nature. So nature matters. Let me give you some even simpler examples. Does it matter if we lose a few species? Oh, many. That's hard to answer, it depends which ones. But here's four quick answers that you can use anywhere. Gaia, rosy periwinkle, little things, and biophilia. The Gaia hypothesis, which is uh, uh, more a metaphor than a scientific hypothesis, is that life exists on this planet because living things make it happen and provide us with an environment in which life can thrive. So consider the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen, and temperature. Now say, okay, I live on the third rock from the sun. There's no life here, or I visit it. What's it going to be like? Look at oxygen. There's hardly any oxygen on this planet. Look at temperature. Don't look at temperature. Go to with life, that's much nicer. With life, there's 21% oxygen. We depend on that. With life, the temperature on the planet averages about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Without life, it's nearly 420 degrees Fahrenheit. Everybody in the room knows what temperature water boils at. I'm not going to make this uh, harder. Second quick thing, rosy periwinkle. Rosy periwinkle, the little flower at the lower left, is a little plant that lives in Madagascar. And from that plant was extracted a compound, now marketed as vinblastin, which is successfully used to treat some leukemias. Who would have thought it? Now the plant is cultivated, maybe the drug is synthesized, I don't know. But who would have thought rosy periwinkle was going to save human lives? And who would have thought the Gila monster has in its saliva a peptide which is now marketed as Exendin-4, which is used to treat adult type 2 diabetes. Who would have known that foxglove was going to save lives in treatment of heart conditions? We all know what eucalyptus is good for, and you all know that at some point in your life you'll be very grateful for morphine derived from a plant called the poppy. And I could go on and on with a list like this, but in the interest of full disclosure, I do have to make a statement now about Gila monsters, bad breath, and the saliva, and the rotten state inside their mouths. Dr. John Eng at the VA Hospital uh, Medical Center in New York discovered the peptide that is now developed and licensed, and it's licensed by Amelin Pharmaceuticals here in San Diego, and as they sponsored this symposium and did not ask me to put this in, I feel I should at least disclose that. Now I'll turn to little things. It was Ed Wilson who coined the phrase in a sentence in a book called The Future of Life, which I strongly recommend, ants and the little things that run the world. He meant ants, because that's all he does. I mean, he loves ants. And here's his highfalutin laboratory equipment, which enabled him to win the Kyoto Prize, the National Medal of Science, two Pulitzers. You don't need any fancy gadgetry. He meant the ants, the bacteria, their relatives, the fungi. I'd also like to draw your attention to the last of the four things, a term he brought into common usage, biophilia. He wrote a book with that title. By that he meant the innate human affinity for life and nature. Some of you out there actually like living things. I can't see you, you don't have to be shy about this, but I will hear whether you suffer from biophilia. Here's the test. And for those of you in the room with it, seriously, the cat. But maybe you don't like living things as much as you like places. And you know where this is. And now I segue into 
So can parks help us? Can zoos help us? Can museums help us? And then I'll give you some reasons for hope in the future. You all know where this is, but you weren't here when Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir declared this area as part of a larger block. The valley itself was not going to be part of the park. When they designed this park, conservation was not on their agenda. If you look at the U.S. National Park Act, it doesn't mention wildlife conservation. We ask parks to do these things now, and their managers try hard. But there are all sorts of problems that I don't have time to go into, and I don't want to come down on parks because they are part of the toolkit. We depend on them. But I do want to make you worry about the last one on the list. They're a static solution to a dynamic problem. By that I mean they're lines drawn on a map. Now here's the Earth with all the biomes spread out in different colors. Now imagine the Earth is getting warmer and it's CO2 times 2, that is when the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere doubles as it will this century, no matter what we do at the moment. Keep in mind that 20 to 50 percent of each biome, of each area occupied by a biome, today will no longer be suitable. That's the problem of having a static park. Maybe zoos can help us. We're living within a walking distance of one of the finest zoos in the world, and it is incredibly important to San Diego, and the re relationship with the museum, I hope, would be stronger. Maybe it will be one day. I think zoos are very important for a couple of reasons. The last few years we've been looking at the records of the, of the zoo over the last 25 years. And those colorful diagrams there show you for primates and for carnivores, each individual species has a different color bar and the number of individuals in the bar is large or small or goes to nothing if the species goes extinct in the zoo collection not going to go into those details tonight, but you see a gradual trend towards fewer species. But don't think that's bad. Actually, if you're changing a zoo, and most zoos are changing, the good ones, from entertainment and menagerie to conservation organization, then it's inevitable that you'll have more individuals of fewer species and you'll be trying very hard to breed them in the hope that one day you can put them back into the wild. And there are about three dozen species that exist on the planet Earth only because of the efforts of zoos, California condor being a local success story. This is incredibly expensive. A million dollars a year gets it started. Most zoological societies can't even dream of doing the type of conservation work we can do here. So the research at zoos will help conservationists everywhere. But far more important are what zoos can do for the public. With five million visitors a year, I mean, you have a captive audience for educating people on what's going on. And it's easy to do. And I'm afraid the zoo, like all zoos, uses baby animals unmercifully to seduce you into thinking they're cuddly and cute and don't smell and everything else. Now, it's research at the zoo that led, leads me into can technology save wildlife? And one of my local heroes, Kurt Bernerschke, founded the research department, now called CRESS, and, founded the, and dreamt up the frozen zoo. And although you won't be told about it, there is at the zoo a clone. It's a cow, it's a cattle, it's a male, it's a bull from Southeast Asia from an, a threatened species of cattle. The Bantang, when this picture was taken, was two and a half years old. It was cloned from a cell line, a fibroblast cell line, that its father donated to the frozen zoo, shown here as a liquid nitrogen tank, 12 years earlier. The father died 12 years before this clone appeared on the planet. So can technology save us? I hate to tell you very, very expensive, only works for two or three species, it won't help us. So I'm sorry I'm not buying into the science fiction. You can dig up all the mammoths and mastodons you like. It's not going to make any difference, even if you get an entire genome out. Because the DNA alone is not an animal. You need their gut symbionts, you need other things to make a functional organism. So I have to tell you that I don't believe technology has the solution. The losses will be irreversible. 
Maybe we can depend on museums. Now, a former student of mine brought his daughter to the museum, and obviously she's trying to say it to, sit, to share her pacifier with a, uh, oh, I don't know the name today, a Lankasaurus maybe. This is shot here in this museum. So again, even at an early age, members of the public are drawn to animals and exotic animals, and that's, of course, a major role that museums can play in connecting people to wildlife. They're also very important for research, and I wish our local museum was doing more. It does, it doesn't, it changes from time to time. But we have a wonderful collection here that could be used for research purposes. So, we have to use everything, parks, zoos, museums, schools, technology, to ensure that we have a future that our children can enjoy. The future depends on, and now I'm going to close with a whole string of slides and give you some reasons for hope, but it's dismal. You have to dig out and get past the fact that in the next hundred years, we're going to lose a lot of species in the next thousand years more. That's inevitable. They will go the way of the dodo. Here's the human population growth curve. The red line is the famous J-shaped curve. We've gone round the bend, literally. We've passed six billion, we're headed for, help me, 7 billion, 8 billion, 9 billion. This graph would go off the curve to 40 billion. We'd all be eating seaweed paste and there wouldn't be much wildlife left to worry about. Or perhaps the curve will come down. I can't tell you what the future is unless you tell me something about humans and their resource use, their footprint. Let's make it simple for a moment. Let's assume humans go extinct. Don't ask why, they're gone. Now, what's gonna to happen tomorrow? I am not at all worried about the dogs. I think the dogs will do just fine, okay? Your cats, bless their little souls, they're hopeless. But what about other types of animals? Well, clever people have thought about this, and there's a nice book by Dixon called After Man. And here's a fin-backed monkey and a rodent that gulps things in the mud and all sorts of other weird and wonderful things that he dreamt up. And there are rodents that are like kangaroos and in the absence of cats, there are primates that look like lions and hyenas and there's a bad kitty cat there. And my favorites are these bats that are flower mimics and they don't have to sit up all night to get food, they wait for it to come to them. And there's an evil looking night stalker which is a pack hunting uh, nocturnal bat at some island in Indonesia. But this is fantasy. I'm not going to waste your time on it. Let's come back to reality. Here we are in the past, here we go in the future. Now I'm going to try to give you five reasons for hope. Here's the first one. The growth rate of the human population has just begun to decline. In my lifetime, I have to rewrite my lectures every year because the number goes down just a minute little bit. So that's the first reason for hope. The second reason for hope is that the paradigms by which we live our lives are changing. We now know man is part of nature. Actually, we should say humans are part of nature. Human actions lead to complex ecological reactions. Everything is connected to everything else. There is no way. Sometimes nature knows best, not us. You can't get something for nothing. There really is no free lunch, and I could go on. Progress, as defined by growth and development, is not inevitable. This is a transformational change in the way humans view nature and their role in it. And so it's not surprising that we, see, we are seeing the development of conservation ethics. We're undergoing a transformational shift in our understanding. Think of it like all of a sudden I tell you we're not the center of the universe, or the earth isn't flat, or we weren't created, or everything changes, we evolve. Well now we have a different worldview of how we fit in things. And I would, if we'd had time, have read you a wonderful long quote about how a conservation ethic is still developing to meet circumstances, and it goes on and on. But it was written 60 years ago by Aldo Leopold in a Sand County almanac, and I refer you to it for inspiration. The fourth reason for hope, we have an improved understanding of what it means to be human. 
Truth is, we never conquered nature. We don't understand it. We're deluded if we think we control it. The biodiversity crisis brings into clear, clear relief the paradox of human existence. Two things. The basic and biological drive, call it the human spirit if you like, toward perpetual growth and personal freedom. That's one side. The other side is the need for interventive and knowing stewardship of the finite living world. The resolution requires the recognition that this is a false dichotomy. You don't have to go one way or the other to your death or doom. Alternate futures are ours. They're within our grasp. All we have to do is buy time. Our intelligence and our recognition of our ecological footprint play into what sort of future we have. So if I were really teaching students now, I'd give you some recommendations to remember for the rest of your life. All make simple sense. Reduce the footprint, promote ecological awareness, promote research before we lose things and then we don't know what we've lost. Keep all the parts. Sustain what's left of nature. Now what do I mean by promote ecological awareness? That means try to develop ecological education programs at the University of California, San Diego State, the other great universities here, K-12, the public. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. That's what we're trying to do, is make sure more and more people understand how saving your favorite species plays into the solution to the biodiversity crisis. So instead of growth and development in our lifetime, I hope we'll hear more about sustainability and stewardship. We are undergoing a transformational change in human society. Now, center of the universe, flat earth, those things took 400 years. I hope this one goes a lot faster. I hope that instead of departments of engineering, University of California will open a department or a school of bioneering. Now, I don't mean new age and crystals. I want to recover the term. I mean bioneering as working with nature rather than seeking to control it. The interventive genetic and ecological management of species, communities, and ecosystems in a post-natural world. So our future depends on the things we've talked about. And we, as individuals in this society, can do something about all those things. So it's all under our control if we have the will. And I hope that nature conservation provides the compelling rationale and focus for our efforts. Now that is way too many words for a slide, so I'll finish with three images. Does anyone care if a species go, goes extinct? There are people who really do. Few people want to abandon the baby. That's the first image. <laughs> Second image is remember, oh, you have to know that orangutans are more intelligent than human infants at this size, okay? Remember, we're all in the same bathtub together and we're all interrelated and interlinked. And finally, you now know this is your baby, you know the rules, please look after it. Thank you.